My spirit does not. Like you know, so friends. Good. Does not like this man at all. And I, I am not uh, new to his channel by any stretch of the imagination. I've listened to him for a few years now off and on. And with him about, I don't know, what was it? Seven months ago or something like that, whatever it was bringing up the resurgence of the awareness to the Noahide and the Noahide sub laws, Noahide.org, go to the sub laws and read those for yourself. Um, I've been listening to him for a long time and he has been one of the voices with his spouse warning about some things going on but i'm i'm listening to this and my spirit is just <laughs> you know how normally with born again christians your spirit is at peace with other born again christians you know you've all been baptized into the same spirit the same christ the same lord the same faith the same body um so on and so forth yeah, I don't have that soft, warm, fuzzy camaraderie spirit with some of the things I hear him saying. I I actually think that he is still very much wor working with Chabad and he has a role to play. And I think they are letting certain things out. And Satan gets to choose the way that he does that. And a lot more could be said about that. I'm certainly wise to the dangers of our government. I'm wise to, you know, the dangers of CIA and what they've been doing for a long time. I mean, just read the Bible and it tells you there's a kingdom of darkness. There's a God of this world. There is an entire world system that is in opposition to Jesus. I get all that. And the governments of the world being part of that system and working against Christ and for the antichrist spirit and coming antichrist, all that stuff. I, I get that. I, I, I see that from the Bible, which is what informs me. But I find it so strange, just a couple things here. I find it so strange that this guy says that he's ex CIA, he's ex Habad, and they're all just perfectly fine with him blabbing supposedly high level pentagon level type of information to everybody on youtube to almost 15 and a half thousand people in six hours and having almost 300,000 subs this video that he's talking about that he's blabbing and says what does our government know they're not telling us it seems that fema is preparing for an inevitable emp strike I also am wise to that concept as well. I don't think that FEMA is here to help us. I don't think that good things are coming to America. I don't think America alone is Babylon. I think Babylon is an entire system of a mate that uh, is with the Antichrist, just like Jesus Christ has a bride. So does the Antichrist have a big giant war bride? Um, and she's not nice. The worst of what humanity uh, becomes during the time of Jacob's trouble in the 70th week and so on and so forth, all that stuff. So I don't have a problem with these concepts, but what he says is so unusual and how they allow him to speak about this. And yet there's other people that when they try to warn or whatever, uh oh, they, they end up dying or this happens or that happens or blah, 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 blah. But he's just allowed to, to spew all this forth. That doesn't make sense. That's very strange. And it's not just that he's some pastor-esque type of person or some YouTuber or whatever. He would have had some type of high-level clearance if he was in the CIA. And the CIA would be like, hey, Steve, why are you blabbing all this stuff to 300,000 subs and so on and so forth? So that just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. And just his whole... Everything about him, it's just smarmy. It's just off. It's just something is wrong. But I'll let you listen to what this plays out. I'm not super into numbers, although I'm not unaware of 
God's use of numbers and also the bad guy's use of numbers. I'm not going to make a huge deal out of it, but I totally noticed the triple three. And um, I'm going to note the obvious if it hasn't hit you yet on how something doesn't make sense. But let's listen to his little vignette here, his little video here, rather. Because I've been sitting on this information now for a couple of days, but I wanted to share this with you. A uh, good friend of ours, uh, Brother Bill, uh, had shared some information with me the other day that really has gotten me to thinking. Uh, and this was something that was shared with him about five years ago. And uh, Shalom, Captain Ron. Anyway, I don't get to see people very often there, but he just happened to be the first one that popped up live. So anyway, blessings to all of you guys that are watching out there. Uh, but any, at any rate, though, Bill shared with me that about five years ago, he was uh, speaking with a friend of his that owns a towing company. And I, from what I understand, I, I assume they have a, a lot of land to be able to store vehicles. And FEMA had contacted this man to be able to store vehicles that would be stranded on the highway. Uh, they Something to the effect that they're expecting some type of large-scale event. And what they did is they put him on a prepayment plan. And he gets a check every month for an event that will happen in the near future. And I wanted to share that with you guys. I wanted you to be able to hear that. I wanted you to know that that's coming. And he also checked just recently only to discover that his friend told him and confirmed with him that, yes, he still gets the check every month from FEMA. Five years straight, this man's been getting checks from FEMA. And, of course, they're not the only towing company that are getting these checks from FEMA. He said there are others as well. Well, the only thing I could think of that would cause them to get these checks is if FEMA anticipates an EMP strike. Well, it seems to me that that would be something that they're working with someone on, not just that, oh, it might happen, it's a random thing, but, you know, <laughs> I'm like blown away. They're, in other words, the point is they're anticipating a large-scale stalled vehicles all over the highways all over the country at one time just to kind of make the perspective a little bit better uh, and if all these vehicles are stalled all over the highways all over the place there then yes then there would be a need uh, for towing services to remove all these vehicles from off the road so think about this for a second we're gonna visit our little friend logic just, just let me replay what he just said, this little snippet, and we're going to take hold of our little friend Logic's hand. Then there would be a need uh, for towing services to remove all these vehicles from off the road. So what does the government know that they're not telling us? Almost as if they're behind what's coming in order to be able to pay these towing companies this money for the last five years. Anyway, just want to drop that in your ear there. Shalom in a world of angels. Blah, blah, blah. So, the EMP kills, kills, kills the electronic system of autos. Right? Steve is telling you that the tow truck autos will be coming to collect all the killed autos stranded all at once prepaying for this service five years in advance the government is the most greedy horrible money-grubbing 
satanic beasts on the face of the earth. But for five years, they're going to issue a check every whatever week, every week, every month, whatever. He didn't say the duration for five years, solid anticipation of all of these auto tow trucks going out onto the road and driving and maneuvering to get all these killed off autos off the road when an EMP attack happens, meaning all, all, all electronics are toast. How are the auto trucks going to operate to go get these? If you... If you have an EMP attack, and probably that is coming, I don't have a problem with that, your least concern is going to be clearing the road, and how would you even do that if you have cars everywhere into probably, I'm guessing, the billions when you look at the whole thing. Food can't get through. You... you <laughs> You're going to have a problem that is so multi-layered, freak out time, something that has never happened in all of human history, orchestrated by the people who intend to murder you. And you think their main concern is going to be prepaid. This is so ridiculous. Prepayment of tow trucks that wouldn't be able autos to go get the vehicles out of the way since all the autos and everything else that runs on an elect electronic device. There's no way that the government's going to be like, oh, we need to totally make sure that we clear the roadways. This doesn't make sense. This is not about fixing a problem. I contend that this man is a liar from the pit of hell. I contend that this man is not who he purports to be. I don't think he's a Christian. I think that he is Chabad. I think he is still CIA. I think he is still um, working for the bad guys. I think what he's telling you is absolutely ridiculous. If you have a freaking EMP attack that kills all sources of light, people's electronics in their home, all industry and commerce, will completely shut down. You pretty much will have the makings for mass panic freak out mode and starvation of famine level disaster. You know, like what the seals say are going to happen to murder people. You will have a nightmare unlike anything you could ever possibly write into a movie script happening. You think the government's going to be like, hey, let's pay the tow truck drivers to go move the cars. We'll store them on a lot. No, you have absolute panda freaking, mo uh, pan um, how do you say that word? Pandemonium, pandemonium. What he is saying is so bizarre to me. I I can't even respect him anymore. And of course, he closed the comments because he knows people are going to catch that. What I just pointed out to you, the part about if the autos are killed, how are the tow truck autos going to go get the cars? And if everything's in the way, how exactly uh, are they going to move the cars? And... Um, how are you going to fix the problem with just that step, Steve? It doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. And I think it's because you're a big giant liar and a psychopath. And I think that you still work for Chabad. I think that you still work for CIA. I think you're government. I think you're one of these wormy little beasts. I think that's why you and your wife know as much as you do about Noahide, because your people, the Jews, and unbelief and the Gentiles and unbelief and our crappy government. They all know about this. They're all in on it. And they're, they're telling you a little bit of information for a variety of reasons. 
and you're putting this out and you want to spread this idea that that you know FEMA and the EMP and all that stuff is coming but his his theory of how it's going to be taken care of is absolutely nonsensical. I mean, this is like trying to put a little band-aid that's broken, no adhesive left on it, onto an absolute gushing artery that you're going to bleed out in a matter of moments is what he is suggesting. This is, think about this. If no businesses can operate and function because there's no more electricity, that means that nobody will have a job anymore. It's not going to matter if people can't get their cars up and running and if there's cars stranded all over the highway. This means it's a matter of time until you die from starvation. It's a matter of time before your home is overtaken. You're not going to have heat. You're not going to have electricity. You're not going to have food. You're not going to have anything. You're just going to die. I, I hope people are getting this. This man... There's something so wrong with this man. Even his countenance, the whole thing. And he's so, he's so, his demeanor about it. I mean, it's as if he's ordering a cheeseburger while he's telling you about this. If, he, if this is truly the case, which is strange, the government would just shell out millions of dollars. This doesn't even make sense to these people to to hold cars on their lots. I mean, how many cars are we talking about? How many cars are in existence in America that are up and running? And you think that they're all going to be stored? That doesn't even make sense. I don't know if the people in the chat even have a clue. Thank you, Sarah Tennessee. She got it. Won't the towing services be stalled too? Thank you. Um, hold on. Oh, hold on. I hadn't really looked in the comments much until at this point, but, um, yeah, I think you're being played with and toyed. I do think there's a threat, but I don't believe that it will be handled the way that he is saying. I think he is very strange. And I think, um, my heart changed towards these people when they brought on, When he brought on um, the patches and they said that Jesus Christ and Daniel used witchcraft and necromancy, no, not necromancy, um, geomancy rather, to divine certain things. That for me sealed the deal and my trust for them immediately changed and they let her prattle on the wife for 40 minutes. But this is something that they have talked about with many people. Jesus used witchcraft to, to, to write in the dust when the woman in adultery was being uh, offered up to, to be murdered and they were trying to trick Jesus. He totally used witchcraft. That makes sense. The sinless lamb of God is going to use witchcraft. Yes, Kathleen Patch, that really makes sense. And they let her for 40 minutes go on and on and on about this in one of their shows. Then it got taken down. But apparently, uh, if you do your research, he, they've, they've gone around saying this. Very strange stuff. For inviting me back. It's always a pleasure. And you guys are always on the leading edge at the tip of the spear of this kind of information. So I love the conversations we have because I don't really have to go through the basics. You guys are already there. Your audience, of course, is always up to speed with what you're presenting. And uh, I appreciate that. It's very refreshing. So thanks for having me back. You bet. Well, and we're glad to have you back once again. You know, when you find something that works, you just keep doing it. And that's why we have you back here. And, you know, it's so funny because we've this is your third time on since episode 100. And people are still asking for you. We get requests all the time. So this is us uh, uh, soothing the masses, giving the people what they want, baby. That's what we're here for. <laughs> so, um, Gons, are we trying to we trying to do any uh, nice, nice, friendly uh, up top uh, uh, 
small talk or are we jumping right into things here? I think we should jump right in. I, I, I think there's enough small talk already. Okay. So Anthony, as you mentioned, you know, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, as we start to get deeper into this episode, uh, what, before that, why don't you let us know what you've been up to? What is your current uh, focus right now? Well, it's pretty much the same thing you guys cover. Um, I tend to go a little bit deeper sometimes to agonizing levels of detail with my audience. Um, I hope they bear with me, but it's AI. You know, I, I really sort of came into the public venue regarding CERN. And, the, and I still research on CERN and speak to it, but really what is the most pressing issue that people can relate to is this exponential explosion, this parabolic increase in the discussion of artificial intelligence. And, you know, the multiple applications of it, the levels of stratification of it, it's almost like weeds coming up in your lawn. It's everywhere. So we do need to focus on that and talk about it because it is impacting our daily lives. So that's really where I'm at right now is quantum computing, yes, particle physics, quantum mechanics, because all of those build quantum computing. And from that, the direct growth of artificial intelligence from classical computing, which is transistor-based, and now into qubits, quantum bits, in quantum computing, and you guys have been nice enough to allow me to talk extensively about D-Wave systems, and I have a new piece to that puzzle called Quadrant, which is a new subsidiary of D-Wave systems, and we'll talk about that a little bit today, but I'm really kind of holding that back for my Patreon patrons as exclusive content and also for my subscribers to Entangled Magazine. Quadrant's the new game in town, and this is, in a nutshell, if you picture a funnel for big data, that's where the neck of the funnel resides, and I'm going to be revealing what they're doing with all that data and how they do it, plus the spiritual, the occultic, as you mentioned, Gons, in your opening statement, the, the occult nature of CERN, and there definitely is an occult nature to Quadrant as well. Go ahead, guys. Wow. Fascinating. You know, you make a, a really interesting point, and I'm just going to make a connection to my own life. You mentioned the conversations about AI and how they really, I mean, it is a topic of conversation that, Gons, you and I, we used to be the cool, weird guys talking about AI pretty much every week on Canary Cry News Talk. Um, and, uh, but it, it, it it, the conversations, like you said, keep popping up like weeds. I was mowing a lawn the other day, a lawn, <laughs> not my lawn. I'm a podcaster. I got to make money somehow. I was mowing this lawn, and two days later, there was there were weeds that were literally a foot tall. And uh, th that's kind of how this AI conversation has been going. Hmm. S -s -s there's barely anybody talking about it. It used to be just us, but now everywhere I turn... Um, you know, there's really great conversations happening uh, in the mainstream as well as kind of the weird folk like us. Uh, is it just a product of the technology um, getting better and, and being used more in uh, products, future products, uh, the, the potential around the world? Uh, that is causing this explosion? I mean, is there anything like this before? I don't remember conversations like this happening when, I don't know, the toaster was invented. <laughs> okay, I don't have a problem with the threat of the AI. I think that is a part of it. But I really want to get to him saying that Jesus the Christ, the sinless son of God, God omnipotent, who never sins, did witchcraft. That's what I want to try to locate and hyper-isolate for you. While Gons and Basil also allow this nonsense. Do you see how Christianity is being redubbed? Do you see how these people that are, have been placed as your leadership and indoctrination coaches? I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. You need to listen to me. Do you see how they're all chipping away, even at YouTube now? how they're all chipping away at the faith. This is absolute 
nonsense. This is demonic. And these Christians will sit here and let him say this nonsense. God can't sin. Hello? Jesus can't sin. Okay, so now he's going to begin speaking about the origins of quantum. The origins of computing, the origins of the binary system, and therefore the quantum systems. We talk about qubits in relationship to whether you're talking about D-Wave systems, quantum computers, or IBMs, or Microsoft. We're always kicking around the name like quantum, which is qubits, which just means quantum bits. And those, again, are just zeros and ones. The origins of all of that go back to the ancient practice of geomancy, which is the divining. Oh, we're getting into it now. There you go. The, the divining of seemingly random marks in the sand, in the soil, the casting of um, sticks and stones, the casting of lots, the casting of black and white stones. You guys, I know this is triggering in your heads like firecrackers going off because you know about all this stuff. But here's, let me give you one just alarming fact that we dug up back in September and I published in my magazine. When Jesus Christ was in the temple. Oh, thank you. Yes. And he was presented the prostitute that the crowd was going to stone. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were accusing her. And the famous line everybody's familiar with that, you know, Jesus said to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he who is without sin may cast the first stone. They quietly went away. Now, here's the point. What was he doing in the sand in the temple at the time? that they were about to start a, um, a festival of water, a festival of the water. He was actually, and I've, I've got the proof, and it's on one of the covers. I think it's September or October of Entangled Magazine. We have an ancient painting, and it's Arabic in origin, and then a later painting done based on the ancient Arabic in which it clearly shows the practice of geomancy by Jesus Christ himself. And I've had people, you know, label me a heretic and that it's a blasphemous statement. Let me put it in context. In the time of Daniel, he did this as well, the sealing up of the book, the interpretation of the dream. But Jesus used geomancy specifically because the Pharisees and the Sadducees were practitioners of this dark art, a forbidden mm -hmm. art. And Jesus knew that the crowd surrounding the prostitute and himself were uneducated, did not know about this practice of geomancy in terms of being able to divine a message put in the soil oh. by Christ himself. He communicated in the secret language only known by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He communicated to them in their language. He put down two symbols, perhaps four, but at least two, via and populus. And he used those because he was saying to them, and in fact, we know there's four and that's coming out in the May issue, the, the other two. I won't tell you what they are. But he put down four symbols, geomantic symbols, four of the 16, so that they would, number one, know that he was schooled in this. Then they would question, how is it that this simple man would even know this rarefied, secret, dark art form of communication? <laughs> And how is it that he is speaking directly to us with these four specific symbols that literally put the fear of God in the Pharisees and Sadducees? They shut up. He gave them the opportunity because it was a secret communication to save face and turn and quietly walk away. Shortly thereafter, Christ was crucified. There you go. Boom. Whew. You know, it's fascinating. I've I've uh, seen only a little bit of this uh, talk of geomancy, and you mentioned casting lots, which I always thought was very strange that, uh, you know, people like the disciples were casting lots, things like that, uh, to try to determine the will of God. Was this some 
uh, I don't know, Hebrew offshoot, cultural offshoot uh, phenomenon that was happening at the time? Or, uh, I mean, obviously you mentioned the Pharisees, um, but, you know, there's there's certain things in the Bible like that where when you really think about them, you 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 feel like there's something else going on. Well, geomancy was a common practice. Even Daniel, as I mentioned, when he was interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he used geomancy to do that. And then God said to Daniel, seal up the book until the latter days. In other words, he was telling him, no longer practice geomancy. Mm. It was a common practice, but God finally said, no, you do not need that anymore. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Oh, Whatever. Oh, my word. This is another example of, yet again, another fake who comes to you saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, along with Basil and uh, the other guy, uh, Gons, and they're all sitting there telling you, on one hand, well, they're they're promoting this that Jesus Christ did witchcraft, and in one 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 breath he says that this was something that only certain people knew, and so Jesus is now going to speak in their language using this demonic language, this forbidden language. Jesus the Christ, the sunless, sinless Son of God, God in flesh. And they're all like, ooh, ah, oh, thank you. These, all three of these people, check, check, and check. Add the wife in, add Israeli News Live in. Their program is still available, blogtalkradio.com. They didn't shut her up when she was talking about this for 40 minutes, Mrs. Patch. They are telling you a lie. And by them telling you and retooling what actually happened in John 8, they are bastardizing and perverting the holiness of God. This is not Christianity. This is more Masons playing the game. I I can't even fathom how many people have been put in positions of leadership and influence on all the media circuits who are Masons lying to you, playing the game Telling you that Jesus Christ, God omnipotent, used witchcraft. That is absolutely preposterous. He was writing out the Ten Commands. He was writing out the Ten Commands. You know why? Because he was a practitioner of good. Meaning he was God. God is good. The law is good. And the reason why the oldest to the youngest, that's a detail that we're given. The oldest to the youngest started running off because remember, they wanted they wanted to stone this girl. And it's kind of like Jesus was like, oh, you want to uphold the law, do you? OK, well, let's talk about all the law, not just the seventh command. Let's talk about all the law. And I'm looking for the part here. Looking for the part where it talks about the oldest started uh, dropping their stones and running off. It was because he was building a case against them. Oh, you haven't kept the first command or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth or the seventh or the eighth or the ninth or the tenth. You're just showing that she broke the seventh command. But hey, you want to get this party started? We can do this. We can get all the evidence out there. And we can do away with these evildoers. Now, of course, Jesus came that first advent to die for the sins of everybody. But these people realized that this could take a very bad turn. And let me see here. Just not tapping into where it talks about the oldest to the youngest leaving it. I wonder if it's also in another scripture, too. That could be the other thing. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came up to the temple and all the people unto him. And he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses... 
and the Lord commanded us that such should be stoned. But what thou sayest thou? This he said, tempting him that they may not accuse him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the ground uh, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Okay, well, what's going to what's gonna tell you what the sins are? The Ten Commands. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, they which heard it, being convicted. Convicted of what? Their sins. What convicts you of your sins? The Holy Spirit. What also convicts you of your sins? What tells you what's evil? The Ten Commands commands that scripture says no one has kept but Jesus who's the judge by the way they went out one by one beginning at the eldest until the last why did the oldest ones leave first because they're realizing oh I've committed the most sins out of anybody here this makes logical sense and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So what you have is all the lawbreakers who disbanded and took off and realized, uh-oh, this could probably turn a really bad direction. And they didn't want to die. So it makes more sense that he was writing out command one, command two, command three. And they, they would have started catching this immediately. They were all over her for the seventh command. But the moment he started a pattern going with command one, command two, command three, they, they would have started picking it up right then and there. Like, uh oh, he's going to start going over all the commands. Uh oh, we're going to have a big problem because she's only been accused of just breaking the seventh command. But heck, we've broken all of the commands. That's that's exactly what's going on. It's not from from Jeremiah 17. If you read in that one comment. That, that um the broken cistern and all that although that's part of of what's going on with the whole issue that 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 people reject god but it's really about the rejecting of god's holiness and repentance and this battle of the wills he's writing out the 10 commands it just makes sense and what patch said to you is an utter absolute lie from the pit of hell there is no way on planet earth he could be in that kind of error and stay in it. And he published it in magazines. So anyhow, he starts out by saying that only special people knew this. And Jesus is now communicating in their language with these dark arts. But then later, he flips it around like the big giant liar that he is. And he goes, this was common to all the people. They, they knew this. So which is it? Because you have opposites fighting against each other, which is a sign of the, or not just a sign, but a demonstration of this double mindedness. This is the kind of stuff that you have to pay attention to that the Masons will do. Because remember, they're redefining what is good. They're redefining who Jesus is. They're redefining the prophets, the gospel, the kingdom, the, the spirit, everything. This is something that comes from the spirit of Antichrist, not from the spirit of the living God. Okay, and also in Galatians 5... I believe it is. It talks about the list. There's a list of things that unbelievers do. If I have the right chapter here. And it talks about, here we go. Idolatry, witchcraft. So if you back it up, it says for the flesh, that's the, the unsaved person that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Um, lust is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. And then he talks about these are the works of the flesh, meaning these are the works of the unsaved person that doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them. We know that Jesus has the Holy Spirit in him because A, he's God and B, he's the Messiah, which means he's the anointed and C, we know the Holy Spirit went inside of him. And D, we know that Jesus only does those things which he hears from the Father. And we know E, that the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So obviously Jesus isn't going to be doing witchcraft. That doesn't make sense. 
And that's like kindergarten, first day of Christianity level. Like a four-year-old could get that, that Jesus is pure and doesn't sin. So how Anthony Patch and all these other people at Canary Cry Radio and Israeli News Live can all um, agree to this, that Jesus did witchcraft. Yeah, that totally makes sense. No, that is absolutely from the pit of hell. See, idolatry, witchcraft, heresies. And I tell you, as I've told you in the time past, that they which do such things that are not born again shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're born again, you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. And here are the things that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are part of, that do, that produce, that, that bring into being. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, tem te temperance rather. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection, uh, affections and lusts. And on and on it goes. Then he tries to say that in Daniel, Daniel 12. So Daniel is like one of the most holy guys at this period of time in Babylonian captivity. I want to go to the part actually where it says close up this book. Hold on. I, I can't remember exactly how Patch tortures this scripture so badly and connects it with, again, doing witchcraft, which obviously the father is going to be using the Holy Spirit to help Daniel with these things, not witchcraft, which is evil. I mean, this is like kindergarten level. I can't believe this man is purporting to be a Christian. And these fools are all around him going, yes, yes, that sounds like the truth to me. Um, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Isn't this discussing the book of prophecy? It's not discussing witchcraft. I can tell you that. So we're starting to understand the biblical model of prophecy as we get to the end times so that it makes sense when we read things in Daniel, like there will be an empire and a kingdom of clay and iron mixed together. And many, many bad prophecy teachers have tried to say that it's mixed marriages, that it's, um, you know, various forms of, of government, uh, that it's, the Roman Empire, this, that, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, when you understand where they're going with transhumanism, that makes sense. So in other words, when you see transhumanism, this idea that we can yoke with AI, we can yoke with the computers, we can yoke with the robots, we can yoke with the computer, and we can upgrade and make ourselves into a new creation in the Antichrist through the technologies and the sorceries. When you see that, you'll know you're at the time of the end. In 586 BC, they didn't have a good understanding of technology like we do now. So it shows you that when you're seeing this, it's a marker that you're near to the end. Watch. So that's what's going on with that. I'm I'm so annoyed with Anthony Patch because actually I had heard his um, wife talk about this, but now I'm hearing him talk about it for the first time. And the reaction of the other two Christians and Canary Cry Radio to just sit there and go along with this is, it's such blasphemy, I can't even tell you. It's so disgusting to me. Okay, Anthony is now saying that seal up this book is this scroll that goes back to some type of festival about water. I've studied Hebrew feasts and festivals for let's see my kid's 15 now where it was introduced to us and when he was two about 13 years now 
I'm not familiar with what he's talking about. A festival of water. Um, and this guy is so weird. Um, hold on. Let's just hear what he has to say. This is just such nonsense. He must be misnaming something and talking about an element and misnaming it is what I think he's doing. I'm that I described in the temple, the water, the festival of water, water is knowledge. And he was sealing up that flow and damming it up until the latter days. Now the book of Daniel, I'm convinced, has been opened. And that the flow of knowledge, the increase of knowledge to us that are possessed with the Holy Spirit. And I use that word possessed because the other side is being possessed of demons. We are possessed of the Holy Spirit is showing us and augmenting our minds, increasing our awareness, increasing our knowledge, because the book of Daniel has been unsealed. It doesn't mean we're practicing geomancy. Now, let me jump real quick over to the origins of geomancy. You, at, you, you, you were asking if this was Hebraic, if this was Jewish. It, it is, but it has its deeper timeline origin back into Africa. So the Africans were practicing geomancy and other forms of a binary system. This, this goes into cantor sets and other forms of mathematics. But coming full circle to what you asked me about 20 minutes ago, it seems like, <laughs> running off at the mouth here. No, it's, okay. it's this full circle. We Stay on script, buddy. Stay on we're, script. We're it's all right there to, in front of you. Stay we're on coming script. to the word quantum and quantum computing. It has its origins in Africa. It has its origins in all of what I just described to you. It is still a binary system. Now, does the fact that it's binary mean that necessarily it is geomantic? Absolutely it is. Mm. And again, we don't have time to go into it, but in detail, in, in detail today, but if you look at the preeminent quantum computing systems out there from D-Wave, which you guys and we have covered extensively, all of the progressions of the numbers of qubits that they employ in each generation of computer walks lockstep with geomancy. And specifically, I'll just throw it out quickly, they are using the 16 symbols, geomantic symbols, in the quantum computing systems to program and operate the systems What's the purpose? It is an interdimensional, by their own words, by Gordy Rose's own words, they're reaching into parallel dimensions and extracting resources. They're getting information. If people are familiar with John D. and Edward Kelly in the late 1500s or later, Aleister yeah. Crowley, all of this has to do with communicating with fallen angels and the obtaining of, of forbidden information and knowledge. What we see in technology today is derived from interdimensional spiritual communication, and this is forbidden knowledge that we are not supposed to be playing with. Go ahead. The floodgates have opened. I mean, we live in this time where it's not just like a drip. It's just it, it, the floodgates have opened. We're all being hit with it. It's crazy. Uh, I'm looking at the chart here, the geomantic figures, and um, so they have it as part of their... The, the quantum computing, help me understand how, how they use that as part of, uh, if you can describe it more. Okay. Um, they will eventually build 16 different models. Um, they are at the fifth and soon to announce the sixth. They have progressed the number of binary qubits by the power of two. They're at the 2000 Q model, which is actually 2048. If you multiply that, it becomes 4096 and on out to the 16 models. Now, the direct correlation beyond just 16 models and then 16 geomantic figures takes us to quadrant. And I'm kind of letting the cat out of the bag here, but D and Kelly, Crowley, even back into Africa, they used a square sand tray, just a square box, okay? not necessarily a cube, just a square frame with sand in it. They would divide that with a cross in the middle into four smaller squares called quadrants. This is what they are using the quantum computers to do, is to replicate 
that same quadrant box. This was used throughout all of the divination processes of geomancy. They are now taking the quantum computer that is gathering data and placing that data in that box. And then they prescribe the square, dividing up the, divata, the, the data into four quadrants. And then they do a reading, divination. They do a reading on where those data points are concentrated within any one of those four quadrants. And the pattern within those four individual quadrants, the pattern of the data within just one square, they are now interpreting, they are now divining the meaning of those data points. These are sigils. This is occultism. This is the devil's playground. Alistair Crowley and other occultist Masonic devilish types were playing around with this. You really think that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the prophet Daniel, one of the few people to sit and fast and pray to God and have God respond by sending an angel after 21 days of being messed with by a more powerful angel until he had to call him Michael came down and told us the end times. You really think that Daniel is going to be doing witchcraft and you have at least, let's see, the patches are two the canary cry radio is another two and Israeli news live is another two. You have six, According to them, born-again Christians that all think this sounds just perfectly normal. If if I was on a program with someone and they started talking about this weird stuff, I would be asking some questions. I wouldn't be going, woohoo, that sounds like the truth to me. Jesus doing the occult. This is insane. And they're doing it to pervert Christianity and confuse their listeners. And to draw away disciples to the spirit of Antichrist, that's what's going on. Uh, uh, you know, exposing the dangers of Noahide laws. And because we have right now division in the body of Christ about it, Stephen, uh, we have some pastors that are telling people that Noahide laws and Zionism and all this is all wonderful and great and it's not dangerous to accept Noahide laws and nothing. Well, it is because you have to deny that Jesus is, is Lord and God. You're not allowed to worship any other deity or, uh, you know, whatever God than Hashem. We, we know this. We've talked about this. All you have to do is go to the horse's mouth, Rabbi Cohen's site that works with the UN and the parliaments of the world at noahide.org. Go to this, the sub laws. We, we've talked about this, but you can establish, you know, that's Yana's voice. And she's talking about Steve. So they're discussing, you know, these really good tenants. And then they start talking around the 18 minute mark, how the one world religion will be based on Kabbalah. I think ultimately, yes, it's going to go there. I think that the whole point of why they had coexist to bring all the world religions together was really just to deliver them to ultimately Jewish black magic and the imposter antichrist. And that's what you see with the Noahide. You have to worship what they say you worship. And, and they also teach the rabbis that, uh, the rabbis teach that, um, even if they're wrong on some of their religion, that when their Messiah comes, he will teach them and he will correct everything. So this is a perfect opportunity for them, for Satan to come in and, and, and correct any type of errors and bring in the Noahide and say, well, you need to worship Hashem. You need to worship, um, the way of Kabbalah, which all is, it's Jewish black magic. They're talking about all this and you know, there's, they're putting enough good in and that's what a good lie is. It's 99% truth. So you suck it out, suck it all up and then 1% poison. And that's exactly what's going on. Let me see if I can hyper isolate the, the portion where she also says that Jesus, the Christ, the son, the living God did witchcraft. And these two also remain silent. 
Uh, although I do believe that Yana at some point goes, oh, that's that's really interesting. Really? That's that's interesting. That's the adjective you would use. That if you heard Christians talking about Jesus Christ <clears throat> doing witchcraft from the occult that Islam has dabbled in, that that many weak, horrible, evil people like Aleister Crowley. <clears throat> Aleister Crowley have messed with. That's interesting. That's the adjective you would use. Wow. This is the other thing that's interesting is that they're talking about how the black Jewish magic is bad, right? They're coding it as bad. I agree. But then they're going to say that Jesus was using the same thing. That doesn't even make sense to a four-year-old. Listen. Come together. You know, we talked about how at this point we feel that we are throwing life preservers to people because the one world religion is not going to be, you know, Catholicism overseeing everything <sighs> underneath, maybe, you know, in the background. Right. But the one world religion that we are operating in is divination. Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes. It's Jewish voodoo. Uh, exactly. Dark magic and witchcraft. Yes. And sorcery. sorcery. I mean, it's I mean, amazing. And I have been... Uh, I'm writing right now a little thesis to refute the book Kabbalah for the Nations by Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsberg, as I told you. And in this book, it says how no, it, the entire book is about Noahide laws. You have no Noahide laws here in the title. So mm -hmm. you just purchase it thinking, okay, how do they want to introduce their Kabbalah to Goyim, as they say? Mm -hmm. you know? And you open the book, an entire book, is about Noahide Law's connection to Kabbalah. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And I know that Brother Anthony Patch is absolutely wonderful when it comes to technology. He's an expert. So your insights for us are crucial. We really want to have you on a lot more often. I'd like to have him go into that in just a yes. moment. But I wanted to mention one thing, because before we went on the broadcast, uh, Anthony was, uh, or maybe it was during the broadcast, he was mentioning how that some of the people were uh, that had written uh, to, to him were concerned about how can something so simple as uh, Rabbi Schneerson's Education Day uh, remembrance of his birthday being under the education uh, 102-14 how could this actually be implemented turn into something that would alter our Constitution and there's several things that I would like to mention just real quick just for you to yeah I mean when when they declare martial law there's there's a, a pause on the Constitution and they can implement whatever they jolly well feel like so I don't really want to spend a lot of time on that um, guess what? When the bad guys want to do what they want to do, they have a way of doing it. They're not, oh, let's just go home. There's nothing we can do. That constitution is so strong against us. That doesn't happen. They take over. Information from Lucifer. And then that information is used to make proclamations over humanity and to control not only through economics, but through faith, the control of the Freemasons over humanity. Through those two venues, economic being the primary and the more ob <clears throat> obvious and acknowledged in the independent media community. But the independent community doesn't realize that at the heart of the free Masonic belief system and their mechanism for implementation of their beliefs is divinatory practice. It is divination. It is geomancy. Can you explain geomancy, please? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Add that. Okay. <coughs> geomancy um, was born, uh, the Arabic term is ilm al-ramal, which is called science of the sand. Um, we also learned uh, through this that techni in the Greek, uh, when translated, means science of the craft. It has other definitions. But very deep down, as you know, we never take the very first definition in a dictionary. Yeah, yeah. You have to delve deeper to get those words. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you find some absolute gems. And techni in the Greek means science of the craft. So that falls right in line with the craft of Freemasonry, and you can see how all of this comes together. Geomancy is a system of div divination. Again, I had mentioned earlier, it's that binary base to stochastic system of random 
number generation, and recursion. And through that, they are, uh, you know, they have a, a method that they use for casting these readings. You know, and it falls in line with the uh, Kabbalah in terms of the levels, you know, the four levels that you have of body, mind, you know, spirit, physical, and then it incorporates in, as you get more detailed, the astrological, cosmological aspects. And from that, they have this system where they generate numbers that produce these characters. Uh, and there are 16 geomantic figures, and associated with them are all of the rules concerning life, how to live it, how to um, define it, how to read it, if you will. And it needs human input, you know, and, and the randomness comes in that you don't think about what you're doing. The, the process is such that they just have a person mark, take 16 lines, if you will, and then just poke dots in the sand. And then it doesn't matter. They count them up, but it doesn't matter the number. It just matters if the number is odd or even in computing, open or closed, high logic, low logic. So you can begin to see how this comes together. So the person then goes through, and the diviner will determine, it, you know, if it's odd, it's one, and if it's even, it's zero. Mm -hmm. And so they will develop, and it's four, four rows, 16, and they come up with the first four geomantic figures based on that. Then what they do is through a recursive process, they then take those four figures, and they do addition and subtraction, they come out with the second row of figures, and they do this until they have the 16 figures. But most commonly used are the four figures that are done through the 16 lines divided by four to give you the four figures. And um, from that are all of the laws that are incorporated into these different figures. There are books. These are the books that Daniel used. These were the ah. books that the magicians back in those days that were employed in the palace of the kings used. These were the ancient rules that went along with these books. This is why when I was giving my, my talk on Daniel in the King, when he came up, everybody says, you know, we had our own people that came against us and said, how can you say that? You know, and, and, and all I can say is that the Holy Spirit showed me what Daniel was doing. Like us, with our cell phones and our laptops and tablets, we are using the system of the day. Stop. So she just told you, you know, listen to these people. They're your leaders. This has been an ongoing joke since we had a change agent come into our church and tell us you need to listen to your leaders. She says that the Holy Spirit told her that Daniel and Jesus were using divination and occultic witchcraft. So, hey, Anthony Patch says it's paintings. She says it's the Holy Spirit. That's good enough for them. Who needs that Bible being the authority and informing them of truth? So she's saying that there's a system of telling the future by divination, which is of the devil. <coughs> uh, back in Daniel's day, and Daniel's totally doing it too. I mean, come on. Why be godly? Why do anything for the Lord? Just totally use the devil's power. Why not? This woman is evil. And I can't believe that Israeli News Live, born again, older Christians would just sit there and, and be quiet and let her go on and on. Unbelievable. In ancient China, they were called day books. Or what's the word? She, 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 or, oh, um, the day books. Um, no, 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 that wasn't it. It'll come to me. Anyway, um, it's part of our research that we're doing right now on ancient Greece and China with these day books that have been discovered. But, um, so Daniel... When, when the king said to Daniel and all of the magicians, I had a dream, and I want you to tell me what it was. Well, all the magicians in his palace and the sorcerers said, well, tell us what the dream was, and we'll tell you what it means. And he said, no, I want you to tell me what my dream was. And they just looked incredulously like, that's impossible. How can we tell you what your dream is? 
tell us your dream, even a little of it, and we will give you the explanation. And the king got really angry, and he said, I'm telling you, if you don't tell me what your dream is, you're all going to be dead tomorrow. What my dream was. What my dream was, yeah. <laughs> and so they, the, one of the king's um, associates went to Daniel, and, or went to the king and said, you know, there's a man by the name of Daniel who can interpret dreams. Let me bring him in. So Daniel comes in, and he is the head of all of these magicians and sorcerers, yet he's a man who loved and served God. Right. So he goes into the king, and the king, and he says, you know, king, what is it that you want? And he said, I had a dream. It was very disturbing, and I want you to tell me what it was about and what it means. And so Daniel didn't answer as the others did. He said, give me a night or give me a day, and I will tell the king what it is. So Daniel at that point this is where the Holy Spirit showed me what Daniel did. He went back to his place with his, you know, there was uh, the others, what, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were with him. And he said, I need you to pray. So he did what he knew how to do in the accessing of unknown information. He cast lots. Now, when we say casting lots, it's not, you know, picking the biggest, the, the, the biggest straw. They had a very detailed system of casting lots. He did a geomantic reading because when you do the four initial four geomantic figures, it represents the head, the torso, the legs, the feet. So now you can see where Daniel began to see the statue with the head of gold, you know, and then the, the chest of silver and, and how it went on to the iron mixed with clay. He got that from the geomantic readings. And so that night, he only had it in part, though. He could only do what he knew how to do and was beginning to interpret the powers, if you will, that be based on the four geomantic figures and their representations in the statue. So that night, he goes to sleep, and God gives him the explanation. But he did what he knew how to do to get the initial information. And then he said, Lord, I'm going to be dead tomorrow if you don't tell me what's going on mm -hmm. so I can tell the king. He laid down, and God appeared to him in a dream, and he explained what he saw. So he goes back to the king, in a sense, damned if you do and damned if you don't, and he gave him the explanation based upon what he was able to read and divine with God's interpretation. Fast forward, Jesus in the temple. Jesus is in the temple, he's teaching. They come, and they, the Pharisees and Sadducees come, and they bring to Jesus, because they're trying, they're coming to him in a, a spirit, a murderous spirit, if you will. Um, okay. <laughs> I need that eye contact. Um, so they come to him with a murderous spirit in their heart. They are going there for the sole purpose of trying to trap Jesus in his words and, and by getting him to judge. They're trying to put him in a position to judge. Now, they are gathered in the temple, and from what my research showed me, it was to celebrate the festival of water, where God represented a fountain of living water. It was a water festival in the, in the temple at that time. So he's teaching in the temple. The Pharisees come. They throw this woman, tell him she was caught in the act of adultery. They bring with him, much like Soros and all of his crowds today that he hypes up, the Pharisees and Sadducees bring this crowd with them, telling them there's going to be blood today. There's going to be bloodshed. Bring your rocks with you. We're going to kill somebody because we're going to stand for our righteousness and we're going to get Jesus to judge this woman. So Jesus knew in their hearts before they got there what they were going to do. And this is all throughout the gospel. So, you know, John and Mark. And um, so they, they throw her at his feet. And when they arrive, they see that Jesus is crouched down on the ground and he's doing things in the sand. Many, many teachings have been said that, you know, he was writing their names in the sand because later on in the book, the Lord says, your names are written in the earth. But because we know what, the, you know, the sand was used for teaching because there was so much of it that would blow in, you know, from the temple that they would use that almost like as their chalkboard. There's never any indication of what is told about what Jesus is writing in the sand. However, these Sadducees and Pharisees who were trained in these so-called schools of life, trained in the mantic arts, 
doing what Daniel did, the elite of that time that were trained in the sacred knowledge of geomancy, in that, that form of divination, looked down on the ground and immediately as they were saying that this woman was about to lose her life, they looked down and they saw what Jesus was writing on the ground. And again, this is what the Holy Spirit showed me. And he told me what these geomantic figures represented. And on the cover of our magazine, it, we, we put the one figure, which was two, four rows of two dots, which represented populace. There's a, there are names for each of these geomantic figures. And so populace, in its definition, and you can look this up online, populace is... It, it means that it represents a bird's eye view of a crowd. This is their interpretation of what populace is. It, it, and it's, it's neutral. It can sway, it can go to the good side or it can go to the bad side. And so populace um, represents a bird's eye view of a crowd. And it can incite or it can calm down. So the Lord showed me that as these Pharisees and Sadducees were looking at what Jesus was doing, they began to be convicted because he was speaking to them in a language that they would understand. We've had people come against us and say, you're saying that Jesus was practicing black arts and geomancy. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's exactly what you're saying. If I were in a group of executive secretaries that went to school when I did, and I went up to the blackboard and I began to write in shorthand, and there's a whole <clears throat> crowd there only the people that studied, like me, would understand what my shorthand meant. I would have to decipher it for everybody else. But those who know would, would know what I'm saying. Jesus was putting, you know, it's not like he was writing paragraphs in the sand. You know, he wasn't. He was very, think about the area that he was in. Think about the situation around them being inciting. I mean, this woman was going to lose her life and there was going to be bloodshed. And so it was a very volatile situation. And so Jesus said to those learned men who taught, were taught the arts, he wrote these geomantic figures on the ground. Now, this picture that I got, I got from an Arab website. I saw this same exact picture on a Catholic website, only the geomantic figures were removed. Mm. So you didn't see them like you see the geomantic figures here. I don't know if I can come closer. Yeah, come closer because we can. Okay. Oh, wow. And these you can are kind of geomantic see. figures. Okay. Okay. So he needed. He was writing in a very small space, but he had to write a lot that they would understand. So he used these geomantic figures that had they contained volumes of information. So they came to him and they were trying to get him to judge. Do you know that populace represents judgment in geomancy? It represents the ability to sway a crowd of people, remember a bird's eye view of a crowd, to either good or evil. Written next to that were four dots on the second of the geomantic figures, which is via. And it was called the way. It, it means the way. It means it represents water which can flow like a rushing river, or it can be very quiet, sort of a marine, meandering, <laughs> you know. So what he was saying to them with just those two geomantic figures, which would only take a small space to write, when they gathered around and they looked down on the ground, populace said to them, you come to me and you bring this woman for me to judge. And I'm telling you, I am the judge. Then you look at Via, which represents the way. Jesus said to them in their language, I am a judge. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. Wow. I am the river of living water. And then I believe the other two, and this is speculation, speculation on my part, was the figure for carcer, which means imprisonment. Because they were going to try and either imprison him, but there was also the figure for um, the woman, wow. which is pu Puella. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't remember any of this in my Bible, and I don't remember anything about taking him and imprisoning him.
I see lots of attempts on his life that were all thwarted or failed. I remember the time when they grabbed him and they wanted to throw him off a cliff. And it says that he walked through the crowd. I remember when they picked up stones to stone him to death. I don't really remember what happened with that, but I remember the Bible saying that it wasn't his time yet. Um, I don't, it seems like there's at least one other occasion, maybe a repeat. Sounds like there was, it seems like there was a lot of times they got together to discuss how they were going to get rid of him. Uh, but they were afraid of the people. And remember, they were being occupied by Rome. So it wasn't like they could just do whatever they wanted. There was a lot of public pressure and there was a lot of game playing going on. I don't recall any time in the Gospels anywhere in the umpteen years that I've read the Bible, any time when they tried to incarcerate him. But I know that I'm just going by what the actual written word says. I mean, it's not like I'm actually hearing from the Holy Spirit like Kathleen is. Or that I'm looking at a painting like her husband, that those two things would better inform them as to what's happening. So much so that they could prove their case that God omnipotent and Daniel were both using occultic witchcraft that Aleister Crowley or Islamics or, or, or whatever would be using. And that meant women. So you had populace as judge. You had Via as the way, I am the way, the truth, and the light. You have Puella, which is the woman. You have me, you're coming to me to judge this woman, and you want to put me in prison, in carcer. So there are your four geomantic figures that could be written, and, and it just kind of could look like he was doodling, doing this, 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 and this. As he's listening to them, waiting for them to say, then they gather around to see what he's doing, and their first reaction is, oh my God, he's reading, he's writing in our language, he's writing in the language that I understand, because look what happened after that. The attacks and the determination ramped up in terms of wanting to incarcerate Jesus and destroy him, because they say he knows what we know, he's one of, those, he's one of these learned men, where does he come from? Mm. And all of that talk in the temple began to get out because look at what they did. When Jesus was being brought to Jerusalem, they were calling him Savior. They were Hosanna in the highest. This is our Savior. And why did they think that? Because the rumor mill started and it got out that this man knows the language of the learned men. No. They thought that because the Holy Spirit of God revealed it to them and they had been in synagogue, however many times exactly they would attend synagogue, I'm not certain, but they had heard the scrolls of the Bible and Psalm 40 and all of Moses' writings and all of the prophets and all of the information pointing, 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 pointing to the Messiah. That's how the ones that did acknowledge him knew. When Christ said to Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, true. And it is my father in heaven who has revealed this to you. But Kathleen says it's because Jesus was able to speak the same lingo of witchcraft and that woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, that went through the population and they went, eh, that's the only one of God. He knows how to write his witchcraft out like we do. That doesn't make sense. And yet all these people just sit there and let her go on and on and on. He didn't need to write out witchcraft language to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He went right out and said it to everyone in John 14, 6. Unbelievable. This woman is a psychopath and, and, and her husband, as they warp and pervert Christianity, this is insane. He knows. And so there was a point at that time where the Pharisees and Sadducees were frightened because they said, who are we dealing with? He speaks as one who comes from God. He knows our language. He knows our secrets. 
Oh my word. When they, they recognized his authority, not that he was in her fictional mind writing witchcraft lingo and language, they realized they were having a battle of wills with God and they were in unbelief and they didn't want to succumb and have him change the system. What this woman is saying is so evil and demonic. I can't believe that Steve and Yana would just sit there and be like, yep, sounds like the truth to me. And later on, if you read the Gospels, Jesus stands up and he gives them a way out at that point because that crowd was there for blood. They weren't going to leave unless they were able to throw those stones at that woman and kill her. He gave them a way out? No, it makes much more sense that he was writing out the Ten Commands to show that even though she had been caught in this one sin, they had all the sins that they had broken time and time again. And there, there is no bloodthirsty crowd. That is not in the text anywhere. And so they ended up, he, he stood up and he looked at them. And he said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. In other words, you just read everything that I put in front of you. I'm going to give you a way out right now. Okay, yeah, I don't even know what they're talking about, this festival of water they keep talking about. Um, when he says, I am the light of the world, this was in connection with tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, some people call it where lights would be lit, lamps would be lit using wicks made from the robes of priests. That's interesting. Um, it's all part of his I am statements in John 8. It says here, seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes powerful statements beginning with the phrase I am. These echo the words of God to Moses in Exodus 3.14. Then when God asks, who he should say has sent him to Israel. Moses, God tells Moses to tell the people, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This phrase implies the simplest expression of God's nature. He just is. He, he must be. When Jesus uses this phrasing, he is deliberately invoking the same essence. He says it a little bit differently than I've heard it before, but I get the gist of what he's saying. This is the second of John's seven I am statements. The first came when Jesus was preaching to the crowd in Capernaum, Capernaum the morning after feeding thousands with the small boy's lunch. John 6, 35 later in the same chapter, John will use a slightly different version of this idea, not part of the primary seven I am statements resulting in rage from the Pharisees. This incident occurs during the Feast of Booths. I don't know what they're talking about, Feast of Water. I've, I've not heard of that. Um, in Jerusalem, Jesus has already used festival rituals as analogies for his role as Messiah. He gives the scriptures as part of the major festival lamps would be lit using wicks made from priestly garments. Never heard that before. In addition, light was a powerful metaphor in Hebrew thinking, Psalm 84, 11 and Malachi 4, 2. Light for the Jewish person was the ultimate idea of representation and salvation, knowledge, and goodness. For God to claim to be the light of the world was no small thing. In fact, it is a claim to equality with God. Even further, the Greek of the passage indicates Jesus' claim to be the light, not merely a light. In the Greek's uh, text, original Greek, ego I me. And I can't pronounce the rest of that, which explicitly claims he is the single solitary source of light. I'm going to have to research this further, but um, there may have been something with water, but it certainly wasn't called the water festival. And he was highlighting light in this section. He was talking about uh, water in John 7, not in John 8, which she's mistaken. Of course, people can be mistaken, but when she pontificates on that much error. I don't have a lot of hope for her. Um, and everything that I am researching, I don't trust Jews for Jesus at all. 
this seems to have something to do with the rabbinical teaching or directive. I know they poured out wine at one point. The Temple Institute, see, that's the rabbis as well. See, and it says became part of their tradition. Usually one for Israel.org is okay, but um, see, I don't trust her at all. Okay, now it's talking about the Talmud. And it, 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 see, it sounds like the ceremony has something to do with the Talmud. I just honestly don't know a lot about what they're talking about. And see, water libation ceremony. According to the Talmud, Sukkot is a time of year in which God judges the world for rainfall. That doesn't sound right. Therefore, this ceremony, like taking on the four species, involves God's blessing for rain and its proper time. And she's tied it all so funny to this supposed occultic nonsense. I don't trust um, Michael Brown as far as I can throw him. Abad, they're also the rabbis. So I I I don't know what she's talking about specifically. Um I know that with tabernacles it was about light. That was a big deal. I am the light of the world, he said. So we'll be wrapping this up shortly. She just again continues on with this same strange line of reasoning that isn't in the Bible. It's all of her added on nonsense. Your imprisonment is foretold. So he needed to say an awful lot to them that would get them to understand at that point. And he did it through those geomantic figures. The, the Arabs know this. The Egyptians know this because they know that this is the language, the secret language that they speak in. Wow. Wow. So that's amazing. You decoded all of this. That's amazing. It's, it's, tr it's truly the Holy Spirit that showed yeah, me this. It so. is. It's amazing. So you have a magazine, brother, sister, that you you give out monthly or how is... how? No, they don't give it out. They procure your monies in order to keep going with this nonsense and to teach things that the Holy Spirit told her, don't you know? That doesn't align with what scripture says. It's completely from the occult. And she already said that these um these non-Yahweh worshiping nations already were fully aware of the Egyptians. I forget the other group she said uh, would know all about this. This is not Christianity. None of this is Christianity. Anyhow, I, I encourage you to continue seeking and searching for yourself, doing research, um, checking these things out. I think it makes the best sense that he was writing out the Ten Commands, and that's why they took off and ran away. Um, there may be more to it than that, but I think it's at least that. Anyhow, I don't trust any of these individuals anymore, and I'm just really having my eyes open to how people are throwing out this ridiculous nonsense that does not align to truth, does not align to scripture, and uh, the Holy Spirit's not the Holy Spirit when he's saying something that doesn't align to scripture, but, you know, they're all special, don't you know? Anyhow, thank you so much. God bless.